Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan and today I want to talk about one of my favorite pieces of Star Wars lore. When you take a look at an Ecumenopolis like Coruscant, it can be very easy to get overwhelmed by it all. Simply put, there's nothing like it in the galaxy that can prepare you for it. Now some people look at Coruscant with shock and disgust. They see that there's nothing natural on the planet. It's like almost a Botoxed up bimbo. But to me, I see nothing but beauty when I look at Coruscant. I, I don't see a lifeless or sterile environment. Um, artificial, maybe. The buildings flow endlessly in every direction. There's hardly any vegetation and even less sky to see in those places. But there is also life almost everywhere. You hardly have to even go looking for it. There's extremely vibrant and durable life that explodes through the cracks, channeled and shaped by the metal and duracree channels that run all over the surface of the planet. You know, Coruscant arguably has more life on it than any other planet in the galaxy. And what makes this life on this planet so different is two main things. One, the life on this planet is heavily shaped and guided by sentient life, and more specifically, human hands. And two, almost every species and culture in the galaxy actually has stepped foot on this planet. And so I see Coruscant as kind of like this index for the entire galaxy. It has a little piece of every corner tucked neatly within all of its thousands of levels. But here's the thing, Coruscant's detractors were kind of right. This planet is a crazy abomination. I mean, remember that scene in The Mandalorian where Dr. Pershing is hanging out with that Imperial spy? Well, they go to the Monument Plaza and Pershing is tricked into touching what looks like a giant rock in the middle of the square. Well, actually, that's no rock. That's the tip of a mountain, Yumate. It's like the whole iceberg hidden beneath the waves thing, but like, to a much greater extent. And that's because Umate was one of the highest mountains in the Minari range on Coruscant, which is one of the highest ranges. I'm not sure if it's the highest mountain on the planet. It's very possible that it might be. Now, Coruscant is relatively the same size and same age as Earth. It might also have the same plate tectonics and you know volcanic activity, we just don't know. But to give you some reference, the highest mountain here on Earth, Mount Everest, is about 29,000 feet. I'm not saying that's how high the top levels of Coruscant are, but that is around that area, which is just completely insane. You know, Coruscant is a true ecumenopolis. As in, the entire surface of the planet, except for this one tiny spot, is covered in miles of dirt All the forests, swamps, strip malls, prairies, and other natural biomes have been completely wiped out. As you all know, here on Earth, if all the trees and biomass in the ocean were taken out, photosynthesis would stop and the oxygen replenishment cycle would run out pretty quickly. By the way, did you know one human being typically needs around 50 liters of oxygen in just one hour? And that takes around 10,000 leaves to produce. And so you would need anything from around a few hundred to a few thousand houseplants to produce enough oxygen for just one person. Why do I know this? Well. I was bored one day and I thought to myself, Alan, what would happen if your apartment got yeeted into orbit? How would you survive? How much you know, air pressure can drywall handle? Apparently not a lot. I think it's porous maybe. And also, like, how many plants would I need to uh, be able to create an atmosphere that's breathable? I have way too much time on my hands. What I also found out was that plants and vegetation are only 30% of the oxygen cycle system here on Earth. The majority of oxygen on Earth actually comes from our oceans and billions of little plankton and bacteria that photosynthesize. Now, Coruscant's oceans have long been covered up and most of its forests have been wiped out tens of thousands of years ago. And so my question is, how do people breathe on this planet? I mean, like, this is a completely artificial rock, basically. Well, that's what I wanna take a look at today. I wanna show you guys how this massive artificial planet can sustain trillions of lives uh, and basically create all these things necessary for life without actually having a true ecosystem. Now, before we begin though, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Onusaber.com, they make these babies, these lightsabers, that would be perfect if you're going down into the deeper levels of Coruscant. And until the end of November for Black Friday, if you buy any Onusaber.com replica class saber, you can get a pad one class saber for free. Simply add both of these blades to the cart and their system will automatically add the savings afterwards. I do really recommend you check out Ownersaber.com's replica blade category. You can find some of their best designs here, including some pretty awesome, but also lesser known character blades. We have Deepa Balaba's lightsaber, the redemption blade of Asajj Ventress that she would use when she teams up with Quinlan Voss. Here we have Cal Kestis's blade fix, and then we also have Cal Kestis's blade broken. Half of this weapon is basically built from the lightsaber of Cal's former Jedi Master. You also have Qui-Gon Jinn's blade, Savage Opress's blade, Kanan Jarrus's blade, Dooku, and many more. 
So what are you guys waiting for? Check out the description down below to get your lightsabers today. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. Is Coruscant more similar to Earth or is it more similar to the moon or some type of artificial space station? Really, think about it for a second. Because it is abundantly clear that Coruscant's entire ecosystem has been killed off and now this planet naturally can't even support a hundred human beings, let alone the estimated one to two trillion individuals who actually live on this planet. Yeah, we only have estimates because the deeper you go, the closer you are to the real surface of the planet, the less information the folks running the city have. So first, let's talk about the important oxygen cycle, or at least the breathable atmosphere uh, on Coruscant, you know, so that most alien species can walk around without a pressure suit. Unlike Wat Tambor over here. Actually, he's not just in a space suit, he's in a pressurized methane suit, which is basically a bomb. I mean, imagine this guy going through the TSI. But yeah, what Coruscant needs and eventually develops is the type of technology we can only dream of here on Earth. For instance, according to the legend's lore, somewhere around 90,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, uh, the entire surface of Coruscant is covered by buildings, and so the humans there have to start building vertically. As the remaining natural land and ocean was covered in duracrete and other artificial surfaces, the first atmospheric scrubbers were installed and started recycling the air to the tens if not hundreds of billions of people who lived on the planet at the time. A large network of pipelines were also built to deliver and receive everything from water, power, sewage, to plasma, and demonic gas for planetary shields and defense systems. You also had hydroponic farms as far as the eye could see, vertically, horizontally. These would go on to produce the nutrients that would go into protein paste, nutrient blocks, and dehydrated meals that the poor on Coruscant call food. The rich, of course, could rely on the massive galaxy-wide trait network that was all centered around Coruscant. You had entire planets that were actually dedicated to agriculture, like uh, Mon Mothma's home world of Chandrilla. You had even more extreme planets like Proto Branch, where literally the inhabitants and farmers on the planet didn't even live on the surface anymore. They lived in space stations because that uh, that fertile land on the surface is so valuable that they're not even willing to live on it. Other places like the forest moon of Endor or the Trandoshan moon of Washka were more like private game reserves where individuals with very peculiar tastes can hunt some of the most delicious and dangerous little morsels in the galaxy. Basically what we have here is a highly complex and well-developed food industry that runs across the entire galaxy. And yes, if you're on Coruscant, you most likely can get almost anything. But like many major cities in our world today, you know, Coruscant is not self-sustainable, right? I mean, where does all this food come from? It comes mostly from import, from various parts of the galaxy. And so Coruscant, just like New York City, has a food security issue. I remember when the pandemic hit in New York City and no one really knew what was going on. There was a rush at the grocery stores and we all remember the toilet paper disappearing, but I remember more clearly was like the food disappearing. That alarmed me. I also found out at that point that most grocery stores in the area I lived in only had a 72 hour supply of food. Now I'm not saying you should go home and immediately build a bunker and fill it with food. Uh, you know, doomsday prepping should be treated as a hobby. Like don't take it too seriously because no one wants to eat like 50 pounds of dehydrated dog food because you predicted the apocalypse too soon. But I hope this kind of shatters the illusion of modern day life a little bit for most people. The only reason why we have access to so much food and products at relatively affordable price and with such convenience is because of the hundreds of people involved in getting that food to your grocery store, the farmer, the person working in the packaging or food prep center, the truck driver who ships it to your region, the grocery store worker who unloads all the trucks and stocks your shelves. These are hardworking and very essential people. And without them, you know, we don't really think about them that much, maybe, unless you are one of them. You're probably thinking about yourself a little bit. But, you know, without these people, we'd be so screwed. I mean, I don't care how successful or rich you are, money does not matter when their society breaks down. And the various factions of the Star Wars galaxy who have attacked Coruscant have always sought to blockade and disrupt the shipment of food and other essential supplies to Coruscant. In canon, no army has ever gotten close to occupying Coruscant, but every army that has managed to maintain a blockade over the planet has been able to get some concessions from the Republic. In 3653 BBY, a surprise attack on Coruscant by the Sith while peace talks were being held on Alderaan, managed to overwhelm the defenses of the planet. Although the Sith were unable to hold the planet because they didn't have enough manpower, all they really needed to do was to fly around, prevent food shipments from arriving, and blow up buildings. The Republic and their Jedi Guardians would acquiesce to the Sith's demand and sign the very terrible Treaty of Coruscant. And the Coruscant also developed massive recycling factories beneath the surface of the planet that really limited the amount of trash that was being collected. And Whatever couldn't be recycled, they just shot in rockets up into orbit, which is pretty much the most American trash solution 
I've ever heard of. America. Now, mind you, this all happens tens of thousands of years before the foundation of the Republic and the beginning of the more modern era of Star Wars history that we are more familiar with. This begins in 25,000 BBY. I can only imagine when the ancient founders of the Republic seized control of the planet, they didn't fully understand all of the technology that's kept below the city that keeps everything running. Kind of like the New York subway system. I am sure that they had to add additional air scrubbers because the population of the planet just exploded. The height of the city also exploded, which was a big problem. Problem. You know, when we look at the surface of Coruscant, it's not actually the surface. As we mentioned before, it's more like level 5216. And so how tall is one level? Well, it's probably more than one story, which is around 10 to 14 feet. But let's just make things easy here and say that one level is 14 feet. That means that the surface level of Coruscant is more than 73,024 feet away from the surface of the planet. That's more than two times the height of Mount Everest, which as we mentioned before, is 29,000 feet high. That's absolutely crazy. Now, I'm not a mountain climber, but I did learn how to ride a motorcycle in the Himalayas. And let me tell you, right around 2,000 meters is when some people start feeling the effects of high altitude. At around 3,500 meters, almost everyone begins feeling something, unless they're completely acclimated, including the freaking carburetor on my motorcycle. That thing was gasping for air. And pretty much the highest permanent settlements on Earth usually don't go over 5,000 meters. That's when you start getting sleepy and feel completely out of shape. Heck, I was with my editor Congo in another high altitude trip and uh, he got hiccups for like days. Now, he is a rock type human being, so I'm not sure if maybe his biology is a little different from mine, but yeah. And the people who actually live up in these areas, the people who are, you know, born in high altitude, well, if they actually came down to where the rest of us were, they would run circles around us and drink us underneath the table. They have some serious superpowers. And by the time you get to around 8,000 meters, well, that's when we reach what's known as the death zone. Basically, the oxygen level here is insufficient and people need supplemental oxygen in order to survive. And that's because the gas that makes up a planet's atmosphere is mainly held on the planet thanks to its mass, along with any protective layer or magnetic field around the planet. You see, the mass of the planet creates gravity, and that gravity sucks all the gas closer to the surface of the planet. The deeper or closer to the planet you are, the denser the gas is. But at 8,000 meters up, the oxygen begins to thin quite a lot. The effective oxygen goes from 20.9% at ground level to around 7.8% at 8,000 meters up. Now, obviously, Coruscant is a different planet, but it is actually quite similar to Earth in a lot of ways. It has a very similar size. It even has uh, the same amount of hours in a day or a rotation. And so if level 5216 or the surface of Coruscant is around 73,000 feet or 22,000 meters, you're basically piercing the stratosphere at this point with the surface of Coruscant. We're talking about unsurvivable conditions. Literally all these people here walking around should be dead, which means that they have somehow increased the, the air pressure of this planet at extremely high altitudes, most likely with those air scrubbers or some type of you know, system that transfers maybe higher pressure air from down below, up top, I don't know. But if you do increase the pressure of the atmosphere at 73,000 feet, you're also gonna do the same near the surface of the planet. And so you're gonna have much higher pressure levels and that can also make life and the temperature a bit more unbearable down there. Or maybe there's some type of like circulation system that I don't know, like transfers oxygen from down below and shoots it up. I, let me know if you guys know more about this. I couldn't find anything in the lore about how they were getting oxygen to, you know, essentially the stratosphere. It's crazy. It should be noted that there are reports that some areas in the lower parts of the city have very terrible quality air that is barely breathable because of all the toxic fumes and waste down there. Some areas were so bad that people actually had to rely on localized air scrubbers and artificial oxygen generators. Meanwhile, all the air in the upper levels was actually filtered before being breathed. On a side note, in Legends, it's mentioned that there are actually microclimates uh, beneath the surface of Coruscant that can span several levels in like these underground Dura Creek canyons, you know, like the moisture can actually create thunderstorms. That's how big these lower levels are. And you also have like wind patterns and all sorts of crazy stuff. It's very fascinating. You see, the Coruscant, you realize that as the natural beauty of their planet vanished and their cities started piercing space, they also needed to control the climate on the planet. You know the whole climate change situation here on Earth? Some people believe in it, other people don't. There's kind of less of that nowadays, I guess, uh, with the hot summers and all. But there's also a third group of people who believe in climate change, but also believe that we can engineer our way out of any problems we might face. I think these people are really our best hope and they're also the people we should watch the closest because some of these guys have crazy ideas 
But yeah, that's what Coruscant actually has. They're, they're, they're changing, they're terraforming their planets and they're controlling the weather. And so Coruscant actually has a weather control system that adjusts the level of sunshine, clouds, and precipitation the planet gets. And they've needed this for quite some time because Coruscant is actually relatively far away from the small sun it orbits, and it actually is normally on the colder side. And so a lot of species can't naturally live there. And so you have these great furnaces beneath the city that help heat up everything, and that Duracrete is really good at holding that heat in. There's actually also a schedule for the weather, unlike here on Earth, where we get a bunch of random people guessing in front of a green screen what's gonna happen. The Coruscant weather net is never wrong with its predictions, and that's because it controls the weather through a system of satellites and chemical dispersion systems that can see clouds and all sorts of other stuff. And because weather net controls the weather, they're always being asked to do like kind of petty things like, you know, clean the federal district skyscrapers with some rain or cancel some wind because there's a toxic spill at the central space Spaceport, or maybe, you know, make summer come a little quicker because uh, that will extend the mating period for the native Coruscanti hawk bats. That's actually a real thing that I read in the lore. Pretty cool. Now, a lot of the technology and equipment that operates this planet-wide climate and atmosphere generation system lines been below the surface. You're actually not allowed to the bottom five levels of Coruscant, and I think most of this infrastructure is probably down there. Also, it's really dangerous down there, so I'm sure they don't want people rummaging around. If you guys remember, during the Clone Wars, the Separatists would actually launch a sneak attack against Coruscant's power grid using disguised infiltration droids armed with explosives. Well, that was more than 5,000 levels down. I'm not exactly sure if the air scrubbers are also in that area, but it's probably pretty close. You know, it's really deep down. This is where all the essential systems are. Now, I imagine that most of these machines are being maintained by an automated workforce of droids, because I'm pretty sure modern Coruscant have completely lost the ability to understand how these crucial machines even work anymore or how they're connected to each other. It's like a Warhammer 40k kind of situation. You just, you don't understand the technology anymore. You bang a pipe down in level 5,000 and you hope it doesn't wipe out an entire level of human beings. It's basically a hive city at this point. Actually, Coruscant makes a hive city look small. I never actually thought that Star Wars would be more extreme in anything than Warhammer 40k. But there you have it. So that is our video for today. I hope you guys learned a little bit about how such an artificial planet can sustain such a large amount of sentient life. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. See you next time.